Now I kindly invite Dr. Bashar Barolo to the stage to his keynote speech. Thank you very much. I, um, my name is Baruch Bermaroglu. I'm from the University of Nevada, Reno, Sociology Department. I would like to um, thank the conference organizers, in specific the uh, Professor Dr. Ferit Uslu for inviting me to uh, deliver the uh, keynote speech to you this morning. I know it's a little bit early, it's raining outside, and some uh, of our colleagues might be coming in uh, late to the conference, but um, I'm again very pleased to be here with you and make my presentation. We will leave about 10 minutes at the end for questions and answers, and I'm hoping that I can uh, finish my presentation in the next 45 minutes, although it has taken as long as three and a half hours at the University of Vienna and other places I've presented a similar um, presentation. But I titled my um, presentation The Centrality of Social Sciences and Humanities for Understanding Globalization in the 21st Century for a number of reasons, which you will find out. I will lay it out in several parts, first focusing on the social sciences and then subsequently to the humanities and a broader discussion on what globalization is, what its logic is, what are its contradictions and the outcome in terms of uh, its operations on a global scale and how it impacts us. And in response, of course, response, how uh, people react to it to bring about uh, social change and transformation. So I don't normally talk from the uh, podium here, so I'm going to be up in the front, roaming around, changing the slides, be a little closer to you. And so I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, I, I can use the microphone, but my voice is quite thick and strong, so you can hear me, right, in the back? Oh, you need a microphone for the camera. Okay. Well, I will do that. Oh, I can do that. Okay, thank you. So, I hope we don't get an echo. Okay, it's not bad. I'm not very used to holding microphones like this, but I'll, I'll do my best. Okay, so anyways, um, uh, let me give you a very quick summary of what to expect from my talk for the next 45 minutes. So I did it in the form of a kind of a two-slide summary abstract of my presentation. Uh, in this keynote speech, I will address, I say, several key areas, as I mentioned, in both the social sciences and humanities that are critical for an understanding of the nature and dynamics of globalization in the 21st century. The study and analysis of the impact of globalization on economic development and political behavior of states is central to the question of wealth and poverty, war and peace, democracy and authoritarian rule that can generate conflict in society and social systems. Uh, focusing on societies undergoing these dynamics, I will address various aspects of social change and transformation that such processes have engendered. Thus, while some see virtue in democratization in civil society, others seek authoritarian measures to maintain social control by employing repressive measures to contain change, as you'll see from our discussion around the world. Um, the link, I argue, between the social sciences and humanities in understanding the dynamics of globalization is through an analysis of the relationship and linkages between social, political, and economic forces with that of history, culture, philosophy, religion, and ethics, which combine to form the essence of humanity with all its class, racial, ethnic, gender, and related characteristics in society. My talk will bring together these strands that remain at the crossroads of humanity to understand the dynamics within which 
the process of globalization is situated and operates. Finally, it is through such an analysis, I shall argue, that it is possible to make sense of the nature and structure of society, as well as relations between its constituent parts in the age of globalization. An analysis that is bound to reveal the essence, essence of human social relations in the late 20th and early 21st century. So that's the summary. This is where we're headed. And we want to build a relationship between the two spheres on which this conference is based. And I hope you will have some questions at the end when we deal with these different uh, spheres of analysis. I want to first take a look at the nature of globalization. What is globalization? What's involved in the study of globalization? Globalization, I argue, involves a multitude of spheres within which it operates. These are economic, social, political, historical, cultural, ideological, and environmental, to mention the most central ones. However, all of these spheres function within the historical framework of the prevailing social economic system and have immense political implications. So the other issue here then is to figure out what that socio-economic system is, what its internal inherent nature is, and how it manifests itself in these different areas that we will focus on in a separate fashion. I also want to look at the logic of globalization. Why do we have globalization? Why is it there? How did it get there? What is the end point? What is the purpose? Globalization, I argue, today, much as during earlier stages of worldwide economic expansion, is fundamentally driven by the logic of profit. Okay? For the private accumulation of capital, through the use of low-wage labor, raw materials and resources throughout the world. This is the logic of globalization. In other words, it's not to get on the internet and chat rooms and send love letters and travel around the world as you would uh, people do in, in tourism and so on. The fundamental purpose of international expansion in the process of globalization from one country to the next and globally is to make money, okay, economic. However, there are other, obviously, consequences of that process. And the second thing I want to emphasize quickly, it's nothing new. It's been around for centuries. It has occurred during colonialism, as you'll find out, in historical terms. Spanish and the Portuguese were among the first to globalize their activities through expansion to different parts of the world, for example, in search of gold, in search of resources, in search of land, dominating people, enslaving them, for example, and establishing different systems in the colonies and what have you. Later, the British Empire, you'll see the British East India Company, and so on. Those were the, among the first multinational corporations, or transnational corporations. So, globalization is not a new thing, although, the concept of globalization was invented in the early 1990s. And that was done to uh, kind of uh, mellow down, so to speak, the kind of economic activity that we traditionally have referred to as imperialism or economic imperialism. So globalization sounds a little bit sweeter, nicer, and harmless, and what have you, and everybody will be in favor of it. When you say imperialism, it's like something terrible. No nation or a group of nations, uh, empires doing it to the rest, but we'll find out. Now, this whole logic is what is commonly called neoliberal globalization, or the concept of neoliberalism, okay? I'll explain that a little bit later on, but it's pretty common to know that liberalism basically refers to free trade, free investment, free this, free that, whatever, in economic terms. However, under new conditions, 
modern conditions. That's why the neo in front of it. Liberalism is the traditional, Adam Smith's supply and demand and competition and so on and so forth. However, neoliberalism today, including in Turkey, especially when it first started in the 1950s, although neoliberalism in general in the world started in the 1980s. So Turkey is always first <laughs> in implementing things. But anyways, uh, neoliberalism means liberalism or liberal capitalist conditions in the age of monopoly, big business, okay? Which, of course, as you'll find out, all those freedoms favor the most powerful, wealthiest, and strongest corporations. That's why they are in favor of it, not small business. Small business always needs protection, protectionism, like national, uh, nationally based corporations. So that's why large corporations are always in favor of this free trade, neoliberalism, and so on, on a global scale, because they will directly benefit from it. Now, let's take a look at globalization in terms of its particular characteristics. So I kind of divided this into three different parts. The first, more social scientific, that's economic, fundamentally, social, political, and military. Second part, Historical, which is more humanities oriented, historical, ideological, philosophical, and cultural. And finally, the third part will include other areas that we haven't touched upon. Okay, so we'll take a look at the economic first, because that's the most important, the dynamic force, that's the driving motive force of globalization. What is that involved? It involves export of capital by transnational corporations. In other words, exporting money capital for purposes of investment, okay? And the purpose of investment, of course, is to have a greater return on that investment, grow and reinvest and so on. Very important. Uh, what does that involve? Export of capital, control of labor, resources, and markets. There's nothing magical about this. This is the logic of doing business and accumulating wealth, and it's perfectly legal to do it, it's the capitalist system, right? On a global basis. So everybody's doing it. Uh, what is the whole purpose of it? Profit making on a global scale, okay? Accumulation of capital in private hands globally. This is not a social service agenda. This is not led by churches or mosques. This is done for private accumulation of capital, all right? Individuals at the core of this and families for their own wealth and expansion. Okay, and you see all the dollars piled up. Okay, that's part of this process. So, what else is involved in this? Well, as you accumulate capital privately, it increases inequalities in wealth and income. So what? Is that important? Yes, it is. Because a widening gap in income and wealth is going to cause problems for the system itself, not to mention for people who are being negatively affected by it, obviously. And what does that translate into? That widening income between labor and capital, or haves and have-nots, dominant forces and the ones controlled and dominated, generating this wealth. It means the domination of the global economy by transnational capital for their own greater profits. The other side of the equation will be those who are on the losing end of the process. They might have jobs, but they might be making nickels and dimes in Mexico's and China's and Indonesia's of this world in sweatshops for one, two, five, ten dollars a day. Okay? While the other ones are making billions and trillions of dollars, as you'll see from the statistics a little bit later on. So, now we have to go to the social. What are the social implications of these, this economic expansion? Well, first and foremost, of course, social change. Transformation of peripheral societies to market-oriented ones integrated into the global economy. Right? That's the whole idea. To go to all kinds of places around the world to bring them into the global system, the global capitalist system. Well, that involves restructuring of the international division of labor through 
transfer of manufacturing to low-wage countries abroad. Remember the logic. You start small in villages, cities, urbanized, industrial revolution in Europe, to the national economy. But once you saturate the national economy, you go beyond your boundaries to the next door neighbors. Before you know it, you're going to across the oceans to make investments on a global scale. So that's very important. But when you're doing that and making those investments in economic terms, right, you're having an effect on the social structure of the countries receiving that investment. Primarily, if you make monetary investment in building factories, you hire labor, and the people from the countryside and agriculture migrate to the cities, peasants turn into wage laborers, working class people in factories. And who are they working for? For those foreign corporations. And who is keeping what portion of the profits and the wages and the inequalities resulting from it, and so on and so forth. Women workers, of course, constituting bulk of low-wage labor in export processing zones, and increasingly elsewhere, is another component of it. Global domination of transnational capital over wage labor in all aspects of social life, not just factories and economic field, and as a result, conflict in social and economic spheres, leading to political conflict between labor and capital and uh, the masses in general, uh, regardless of their social and class standing. Now, let's take a quick look at political implications of this and also the military. And in that sphere, things get a little bit more complicated. Transnational corporate control, I argue, and influence over national states has led to the erosion of democratic governance. If outside forces to make money have to influence local governments and local governments in order to keep the peace and control over labor have to resort to, right, political pressure, repression, military force, and so forth, we're not going to have democracy. We're going to have dictatorship. And you know that from the Arab Spring, Mubarak regime, 30 years of dictatorship, people finally saying enough is enough and rise up against that system because even if you win 99% of the elections with 99% of the vote, that doesn't guarantee any democracy. Otherwise, you wouldn't have millions of people going into the streets to demand uh, their freedom and liberties. Uh, support of right-wing authoritarian regimes in the periphery has led to bureaucratic corruption and violation of human rights. This is also very important. It's not just wage labor, income and wealth differences, but repression of the people. Remember in Egypt too, they weren't going into the streets to get more money and higher wages. They were saying, we want to overcome fear. Once you overcome fear, the next step is to gain your freedom, liberty, freedom to speak out without fear of being repressed by the police and by the military and so on. So this drive for freedom is very psychologically based. That is, your dignity is at stake, not just dollars and, you know, uh, accumulating a little bit more money to pay for your expenses. The leading state of the global economy, I argue, <coughs> currently the United States, now dominates the world and dictates its turns over other states as a political, military superpower. This is more and more evident, obviously, in the post-Cold War period, where the U.S. has emerged as the dominant force. Although we do have rivals coming to the fore, such as China, the BRICS, uh, Brazil, India, China, uh, Turkey, and so forth, as emerging economies uh, trying to become uh, uh, powerful players in the global political economy. Uh, this has led to rivalry and political diplomatic crises, I argue, between the major powers that may lead to political instability, that's for sure, but also occasionally to war, world wars, actually. Uh, if you look at the history of the First and the Second World War, these were outcomes of not East and West, or communism against capitalism, or what have you. They have been fought between those advanced industrial capitalist countries in Europe and elsewhere. So these rivalries are very important to explain uh, the global political economic situation. Let's take a go back go now to our second part. We're running out of time, obviously, as usual, to humanities and focus on history. 
How did this evolve and develop historically? Very important. Well, historically, globalization is a historical phenomenon, I argue, because it stretches from colonialism to modern imperialism. History of Spanish, Portuguese, French, Dutch, Belgian, etc., colonialism and British and US imperialism, I argue, is replete with worldwide economic plunder, exploitation, and oppression. The crimes committed by these powers against native indigenous peoples from the 16th through the 20th centuries are well known as a dark page in the annals of world history. We don't have time to go into the atrocities committed by the Spanish in the Yucatan against the Mayas, for example. I was in that major city of Merida in Yucatan, for example, in the city hall, as in Mexico City, they have Diego Rivera's murals. The murals in the city hall in Merida where blood actually is pouring down the stairways of the mayor's office. Why? Because it's three-dimensional. It shows the slaughter of the Mayan people by the Spanish with the cross in one hand and the sword on the other hand. So blame Islam or the clash of civilizations as you wish. Christians have been at the forefront of this process in terms of searching for gold, searching for money, enslaving people, and slaughtering them in the effort to convert them to their own religion. But their religion, later we find out, turns out to be money, gold, not the word of God or the Bible. Okay, enough of Christian bashing. <laughs> Even though I myself am Christian, in theory. I was born in Istanbul, Turkey, of Armenian minority nationality. I went to the U.S. 50 years ago, and I live there. I have an apartment here. I come back and forth every three or four months, and so forth. But, um, so, I know from both sides of the, you know, uh, ocean, so to speak, and uh, philosophical basis to evaluate this. The globalization of capital, I argue, through this historic process of worldwide expansion has been the primary cause of underdevelopment in the periphery. If one group, through colonialism and imperialism, comes in and loots, enslaves people, take the resources, of course they're going to develop, and you're going to underdevelop, right? Because all these resources are gone, especially when they're natural resources, and they are depleted in the long run. The ensuing subjugation and dependence of countries in the third world on the colonial and imperial powers has been the obstacle to further development of the various regions of the countries of the periphery. And these historical realities, I argue, of global and imperial, uh, colonial and imperial domination has resulted in the depletion of resources, enslavement and exploitation of people, and rapid corruption and criminal activity across the globe. In terms of military hardware, weapons trades, drugs and all kinds of international sex trade and so forth and so on all for the purpose of to make money and in the process harming people this is this is the critical element because we're concerned about people not money they're concerned about money not people so we got a problem here okay so let's take a look at the cultural sphere real quick in the cultural sphere, the globalization of capital fosters cultural domination, what anthropologists call cultural imperialism. In other words, forcing one's culture over others, right? Through a variety of processes. You're seeing that all around you, right? How the local culture becomes affected when you start eating Domino's pizzas and KFCs and <laughs> McDonald's and all this stuff. And it affects your natural uh, being, you know, in terms of health, nutrition, all that stuff. Even though it kind of seems like culturally, oh yeah, I've got to eat some McDonald's. So if you start, or <laughs> Russia today started closing down McDonald's for political purposes, but again, it's a symbolic thing against the West, so to speak, when they are present in the new culture. It involves, but this is more important though, uh, you know, all jokes aside, it involves the imposition of cultural values on other societies to integrate them into the global political economic system so that once they're culturally integrated, they will accept the economic system and hope that they'll benefit from it. 
they'll become rich too. That kind of an argument. However, and these are the icons, of course, that we mentioned a little bit. Why would you want to drink coffee in Starbucks when you have Cafe Dunyasi, right? Which is the world of coffee in Turkey. That's better than Starbucks. And Starbucks is uh, traditionally located in Seattle, Washington, which is a state above us from Nevada. Uh, and all the money will go there instead of then going to, I guess, uh, staying in Turkey, going to Bursa, or the origins. But I did find out the other day, the owner of Starbucks now is a consortium of Arab countries. Did you know that? Starbucks. All the money from Turkey, from all the different branches of Starbucks, goes to the Arabian countries, pri primarily Saudi Arabia. So look into that. Um, so yeah, it's better from the national economic point of view uh, to go drink your coffee at uh, World of Coffee. But you see those icons, you know, Superman, Mickey Mouse, CNN, CNN Turk, Burger King, Cigarette, of course, you know, uh, kills you, but it's better to smoke it and look like an American Marlboro with the cowboy hat and stuff. <laughs> John Wayne. John Wayne, yeah. There's the cowboy right there. <laughs> he could have had a Marlboro in his mouth, you know. But uh, it's more seriously, by the way, the dominant values promoted by this form of globalization become the new values adopted by societies in, and around the world. And what are these values? Such values easily translate into consumerism, private accumulation, and other individualistic practices that are opposed to cooperation, community-based social values. And this sometimes if you're you know, of a specific uh, religious orientation, it also goes against these religious principles of working together, cooperation, and so forth, uh, which is more community-based, right? Not money-based accumulation for private consumption and private accumulation, uh, uh, and it has social consequences as well. The globalization of capital is able in this way to promote and spread its values and culture across the globe to legitimize the political economic system on a worldwide basis. In other words, cultural, philosophical, ideological kinds of, uh, you know, uh, uh, forces are at work in order to legitimize it so the economic forces can come in on that basis, on the basis of that kind of thinking so that they can do business in the local country and then politicians can promote tax cuts, benefits, and so on for foreign investment and then make an argument that foreign uh, investment is beneficial to the country because it'll create jobs, pay taxes, and reinvest in the country and so on and so forth. Even though sometimes these politicians and big business owners locally are often in joint ventures with these corporations. I'm sorry to say, even in communist China where you have communist officially government officials and institutions, factories, corporations, and organizations that are doing business as joint ventures with US, European, and other capitalist corporations to make money. Well, maybe for social purpose, when the government does that, but we have to look at the distribution effects of that, if it's trickling down to the people or going into corruption into the pockets of middle and upper level management. Okay. Very quickly, ideological and philosophical, I know we're running out of time, there's a lot to talk about. As I warned you, uh, in Romania, it was three and a half hours. In Vienna, almost four hours. This one has to be done in 45 minutes and we got about 20 minutes probably left or less. So, ideologically, neoliberal globalization propagates the superiority of the private capitalist economy that prov promotes, these are the key words, privatization, that's a very key word. Private profits for the accumulation of private wealth. Why do I say privatization is very important? When I was visiting some of the former Soviet republics, they even created a privatization department. Where I went in there and I said, oh, what is this department about? He said, uh, privatization department. Oh, okay, what do we do here? Well, we're looking for foreign investments, investors. I said, oh, okay. I like to buy some of your factories. What do I have to do? They gave me an application form <laughs> to sell all the wealth of the former Soviet Union. That's why you have this trickling of foreign investment 
all over the former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, and so forth. And at some point, with the local bureaucracies and so on, corruption and mafia capitalism begins to develop internally when there are no checks on that process. Uh, it celebrates private ownership of property and resources and criticizes the public sphere as inefficient and undesirable. Uh, even in Turkey, you have such things as the social state. Not socialist, but social. Like social democratic governments would have some social safety net, social devlet in Turkish, where you have some concern about covering the needs of the people as opposed to purely privatizing everything in the traditional uh, uh, liberal sense. These ideas, there are a uh, these ideas, however, I argue, are a reflection of the class interests of private capital. These are not your and my ideas, per se, unless you're in favor of the system, from the working people's point of view. But in order to develop these ideas that are beneficial to a particular class of people, right, accumulating this wealth, they have to sell those ideas as good ideas to the general population so the population would accept it. And then you minimize conflict in terms of opposition to this kind of idea and activity. Okay, very quickly, again, such ideological and philosophical views and pronouncements are disseminated by the corporate media and the state in order to legitimize, as I mentioned, the political rule of capital over labor and society. But as the legitimacy of global profit making comes under attack, as it will ultimately, the ideology of neoliberal globalization is beginning to face opposition from popular forces advocating an alternative to the current global political economic system. My colleague here, uh, Marat, uh, mentioned this morning that there was, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, in Iceland, a national movement against the forces that dominated and caused, brought about the Great Recession. First, in Iceland, through a leftist, social democratic party, national forum, some 93% of the people, through referendum, decided to not pay the debt back. IMF immediately shut down Iceland and refused to extend any new loans. Now, Iceland is a capitalist country. It's not a socialist or communist country, right? So, if Iceland can try to find a way to fight back, then imagine what other people might do around the world if it's led by more radical elements such as labor, socialist, communist, and other kinds of social movements to counter this kind of capitalist activity. Now, there are other areas. We have only 10 minutes or so left. Environmental, I'll go through very quickly. And by the way, uh, I'll be willing to make available a copy of this PowerPoint for you later, if you wish. Just see me, give you my card, and send me an email. I'll send you a copy of it because we can't cover everything here. So here I argue that the destruction of the ecosystem and the living space through pollution, contamination, and disposal of hazardous chemicals is intended to increase profits and has led to a global ecological crisis. It costs money to clean up things once you mess it up, right? And when you mess it up and there is no social responsibility, so if you're going to make more money from it, that's okay, not a problem. You can go ahead and do it, especially if government permits you to do it and get a kickback for it. That's the part of that corruption that takes place. The deterioration of the quality of air, water, soil has long-term consequences that are irreversible, I argue, or extremely expensive to clean up later. In their drive to maximize profits, the transnational corporations have turned much of the world into a dumping ground. No question about it. The destruction of the environment through this process, I argue, has placed the future of our planet at risk. Great risk, actually. Okay, so let's turn to labor very quickly. What's going on? These are familiar faces in the third world. Children, women, and so forth, female labor for very, very low wages. When we look at the developing countries, the third world, what do we find? Source of cheap labor for the transnationals, whether it's in Mexico, Philippines, China, other places, as little as $3 a day. High rates of labor productivity and immense profits 
using sophisticated technology, but who gets the benefit of that? The companies do, not working people by uh, receiving higher wages. Sweatshop conditions in the global garment and electronics industries with long hours of work. And of course, you have poor working conditions, high accident rates, health hazards. I mean, I don't have to go into the details of Bangladesh and other examples all around the world where you, when you hurry, hurry, hurry people to produce things to make more money, well, you're going to have some big problems you know, along the way. Uh, marginalization of labor through mass migration to urban areas is another major problem. Leads to widespread unemployment and poverty. Of course, uh, many people in the third world travel from the agricultural hinterlands to the big cities. And you have congested situation in the big cities. Uh, there's no guarantee of jobs. And the poverty population turns into the tertiary sector. And in the informal economy, they're making nickels and dimes. That's not going to be not only not good for them, it's not good for the national economy either. That is not going to be a major basis for uh, a, a demand-based economy to purchase things to keep the economy going uh, by creating new employment, new production of goods and services and so on. Anti-labor, anti-union and anti-democratic laws and human rights abuses by repressive states that are subservient to global capital. I mean, these people are traitors the dominant ruling elements and the government officials and so on in these countries when they sell their country down the drain, so to speak, for their own private gain while their comrades and fellow citizens are in massive poverty. I don't want to go into the details, we don't have time for it, but on the eve of the uprising and revolution in Egypt, 70% of the Egyptian people were making less than $2 a day. Unemployment more than 40 to 50 percent among young people. And how much money did Mubarak pocket and deposit in European banks? 76 billion dollars. In Turkish, milliard dollar. That's the new milliard, not the old milliard. <laughs> A lot of money. One person getting 99 percent of the vote, while 70 percent of his people are making less than two dollars a day in massive poverty. So I don't have to explain the reasons why people will be upset about this whole thing. Now, uh, I know we're running out of time, but it's also important to look at the other side of the equation. Not just the third world. People in the United States are suffering today. So not all people in the US are benefiting from this. Because as you know, the United States is a class divided society too. The wealthy people on top, homeless people on the street. Every time I drive to the local supermarket, I see people with a sign saying, uh, we'll work for food, homeless, please help. One dollar will help. That kind of situation. Not that many, but still many, many more are making very little in wages so that the gap in the US is widening between the very wealthy and the uh, masses of the people. Declining domestic industrial production due to transfer of manufacturing to developing countries, especially China, is one element causing this problem, and immense dislocations in the national economies of the developed countries. As the massive expansion of capital worldwide has resulted in hundreds of plant closings. Factories are closing down, production is moving to the third world, first across the border to Mexico, what they call maquiladores, very cheap labor, then transporting it back into the US, selling it at double, triple, quadruple. Go to China, make a shirt for $2, bring it to Macy's in New York, sell it for $49, $29, whatever. Huge difference in terms of the cost of production and the final sale price and the profits and all the other ones feeding into it as a middleman in the subcontracting ladder from US to China. And thus ensuring High unemployment and underemployment, this consequence, has led to shifting jobs in the US, lowering the standard of living. Well, what kind of jobs are people getting when they used to work in the factories and make 20, 25, 30 dollars an hour? They're making the minimum wage at McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, KFC, fried chicken, and so on. So that's the service sector. Service sector, low wage, part-time, non-union, 
extremely low standard of living. You're not going to get an economic expansion in the U.S. relying on these people to go shop every day and buy things, cars, refrigerators, laptop computers, and so on and so forth. They're going to hold on to what they've got. Declining in, un uh, declining in union membership due to loss of unionized jobs have been outsourced to other countries. Every time a job is outsourced to China and the factory closes down and you're unemployed, you lose your union membership. You lose your retirement benefits. You lose your other benefits that you have in addition to the job that you don't have. You go to the unemployment lines and try to uh, pay your bills. Declining wages of millions of workers, of course, have meant dropping the living standards of American and other European working people more and more, and further polarization in income and wealth between labor and capital, I argue, has led to social inequality. Countries like in Europe, especially the United States, are the most unequal in world history. Why? You will say, well, how can that be? Their standard of living is very high. Well, imagine the billions and trillions of dollars that are being made on top compared to the basic living standards. Uh, even if you have a job, huge amount of money transactions taking place, of course, that any time in history will lead to the widest gap between the top layers of society and the bottom layers, even if the bottom layers are higher than, say, what people are earning in China and other places in the third world. Very important. Just to wrap things up, we're coming to the very end, hopefully. Uh, these challenges, I argue, in the global political eco economy have led to renewed conflict in societies across the world. The continued repression of labor has further intensified this conflict on a worldwide scale, and the global domination of capital across the world has led to increased political and popular resistance. And this, in turn, has brought together social forces that have similar interests in conf confronting global capital. This we're seeing more and more, of course, in many countries around the world. We have strikes by trade unions and progressive organizations. We have protests and demonstrations all around, including Turkey, by the way, last year and other times, uh, when there are situations where people uh, in general are being affected economically as well as socially, politically, and otherwise. The politicization of labor's response to neoliberal globalization has resulted in the following, very quickly. Increasing number of strikes and demonstrations and popular protests, formation of new political organizations of labor, women, racial and ethnic minorities, promotion of class politics to confront capital and its political arm, the state, right? This is an economic thing that translates into political response. Organizing efforts by labor unions to mobilize workers across national boundaries so that it's an international effort rather than national one. Why? You realize that, right? Because the bosses are the same. Whether it's Nike or you know, Burger King or McDonald's or Starbucks or General Motors or Ford or Microsoft, they're all working. And I tell my students always, if all the working people in the world who work for those large corporations, instead of wearing their national costume or flags or whatever, wore the costume, the you know, the dress, shirt, pants, whatever, of the corporation, and you looked at from outer space, you will see Microsoft everywhere. You will see General Motors and Ford everywhere. National boundaries will be all broken down, and you will see that one group of people working for another group of people, and these people are worldwide. Not only capital is worldwide, but labor is worldwide. So you have a late, uh, worldwide situation in which labor and capital, regardless of language, nationality, location, and so forth, or religion, are the two major groups in this age of globalization that are confronting each other. Unfortunately, in one case, for their own private accumulation, in the other one, trying to survive, pay the bills, and try to improve their condition. So, that will bring about major problems in political terms in the future. A broader, I argue, global unity of working people is becoming labor's response to neoliberal globalization. Now, 
whether there is an element of religion in some cases, women take the leadership in the others, youthful young people do this or that, whatever it is, it's for this broader coalition of forces among the general population. It's a people's kind of movement too. I mean, it's very difficult to separate out in Tahrir Square in Egypt. Who is in the leadership and what forces are there? What is their class composition? That is a secondary thing to worry about later in terms of the leadership taking the country in a new direction. That's important. However, in terms of the protest, more and more people are beginning to become affected by this negatively. So it's a people's movement on a worldwide basis. And women, by the way, in quite often uh, cases, are taking the leadership in this, uh, not only you know, in the third world, but also by linking and uh, networking with those in the advanced capitalist countries as well. And you have some scenery in different places around the world where more and more resistance is taking place. I just want to toss that in. And finally, the conclusion. Zero minutes left. <laughs> conclusion. I argue in ending this by saying as the restructuring of the global economy moves ahead, with increasing speed, and as conditions deteriorate for working people throughout the world, the potential for renewed popular resistance increases. It's inevitable. It must. Well, people by leading these forces can speed up the process, but it is in the long run, uh, unquestionably, uh, will be the outcome because people just don't want to be oppressed and they don't want to be dominated and told what to do. They will have to strike back. This makes it possible for people around the world, I argue, to share their experiences, as we are here, to share them in different ways, and build bonds towards greater understanding of their position, interests, and potential for struggle to improve their social condition. Finally, I say this struggle, which increasingly becomes political over time, evolves into a global struggle, a struggle between labor and capital on a worldwide basis. Therein lies the possibility of renewed global solidarity of working people and the masses in general that leads to new forms of struggle to advance their interests on a worldwide basis. And we will end it there, and I will take some questions. Thank you very much. And I say, but this is really not the end, just the beginning. Why? Because we have a wonderful conference coming up with all kinds of different papers being presented. And uh, I wish you the best in this conference. But before I take your questions very quickly, we still have about five, six minutes left before 10.30. I'm going to run through uh, a few tables and charts. I think you will benefit from it. And those of you, again, who want a copy of this, you can look at it in more detail. So I put together a few tables. I call it data on globalization of US capital and its impact on the United States, because that's the most important. Because if they're affected by it, and their economy, and I call empire, is on a downward trajectory, declining, that will have great impact and implications for other countries around the world that are tied into the global economy through the United States as the leading force. Right? So when you look at the growth of U.S. private investment, what do you see? 1950, only $19 billion were invested right? in terms of the total value of assets. Long-term and direct investment was only $12 billion. That's direct investment in terms of investment on, uh, uh, on the soil of a particular country in building factories and so on. Uh, 1950, when you come all the way down to 2014, the latest data, Total U.S. investment in the private sector in the third world is $23 trillion. What does that tell you? There is a lot of money to protect. You see why 150,000 troops came to Iraq to make sure oil doesn't go to China or some other country to, to control the industrial heartbeat, right, in terms of the natural resource that is necessary to keep the factories and the engines running. You don't want any rivals to come and take that over 
and uh, be your competitors, especially China and others, Japan and so forth. We need that oil. Uh, so there is a lot of money at stake to protect, and that's why a lot of money is being spent to protect the $23 trillion. The U.S. spent $1 trillion in its war in Iraq, and had another half a trillion in Afghanistan. At a time, this is why I say the U.S. empire is declining, at a time when the United States has a deficit of $18 trillion, and quite a big chunk of that they owe to where? China. That's right. That's right. Well, unfortunately, I mean, China can bring down the U.S. empire. However, since that would affect them negatively too, there is no point in them to retaliate against the United States because they will collapse too. First, trade wars close all the avenues for them to sell their products. Well, they can sell to Europe, but U.S. and Europe together, like the pressure being put on Putin in Russia and so on, could become uh, uh, ignite a world war between the West and China as they declared war against the former Soviet Union in the Cold War, as you know. So there are a lot of tensions going on against China. Even though, at a time when American companies are doing more business in China than they're doing inside their own country in the United States. This is one of the contradictions. Very interesting. That means the American large corporations have no inter national interest while they use the national military to protect their interests in the global economy. So the national economy and the people stuck in the US, like myself, are going to suffer while the large corporations will make a lot of money from their global operations. And then I will pay my taxes to send the troops to defend their interests halfway around the world, even though I might become unemployed and lose my house and have no insurance, health insurance. I do as a professor, but many Americans don't when they lose their jobs, okay? So finally, very quickly, here is military spending as well as the gross debt and so on. Here is what you have. Uh, 1970, 81 billion. 2010, latest figure, $693 billion military spending. Gross federal debt as of 2010, 13.5. In 2014, we just got the economic report of the president, I didn't have time to put it here, $18.1 trillion. Annual budget deficits continue to grow, net interest paid to the banks, very large amount. Very quickly, here is what's happening to working people. On the other hand, in terms of inflation, in terms of the real wages, look at the real wages. I mean, people are not making any money at all. In fact, in most of the years are negative every five years. So the value is being lost. And a couple more quick statistics. Corporate profits are going through the roof. As of 2010, even through the Great Recession, from 2005 to 10, remember? 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and so on. $1.7 trillion, $1.8 trillion, as well as in domestic and uh, global total profits. And finally, when you look at the other side of the equation, total aggregate income, look at income inequality, 1975 to 2009, the latest data, unfortunately, as of 2012, in the statistical abstracts, it's around 3 to 4 percent for the lowest 20 percent, right? When you go to the highest 20 percent, it's half the national income. So if you look at the bottom 20 percent and the next 20 percent, 40 percent, are making around 11, 12 percent, when you look at the top, Two 20 percentiles, 40 percent, is making three quarters of the total total income. Now this is nothing compared to the next table, which is based on wealth. Wealth. Look at here. When you look at investment assets, stocks, mutual funds, financial securities, trust, business equity, and so on, put it all together. The top one percent owns 50 percent of the total wealth of the U.S. Look at the top 10 percent. And you and I are probably not in the top 10%. Almost 90% of the total wealth is in the hands of the top 10. This is what I meant by the US being the most unequal society. Even when you bring in medieval Europe, two, 3,000 years ago, the empires and the slave system, and several hundred years ago, feudalism in Europe, under modern capitalism in 2014, 
the U.S. is the most unequal society because 90% of the wealth, more or less, is in the hands of the top 10%, while the bottom 90% has this minuscule 12% to show for. I'm sorry to say, this is the reality of it. And finally, the charts. This is a very extended one, you can read later for yourself. But this is a complicated nature of it. When you take the countries out of the picture, so there are no national conflicts in, you know, uh, uh, being uh, going to war or having uh, uh, problems dealing with and so forth. And look at the areas of the different parts of the world. You look at North America, primarily the U.S., Canada, and so on. You have East Asia, primarily Japan, the leading capitalist countries. Western Europe, primarily Germany, and so on. And then you've got the third world. So what do we see quickly? These dark ones show you the class alliances of the top elite, the dominant owning class. Capitalists here, allied with those in the US, those in Japan, and in the third world, of course, you have a combination of uh, private capitalists and landlords in semi-feudal areas and oil kingdoms, some of them, and so on in the third world. And then the opposite, you have working people here, not only being oppressed and exploited right here by foreign investment, by foreign investment from Europe, the US, from Japan, but also working people here are being oppressed and exploited by their own owners, the capitalists. So this is not a nationalistic, chauvinistic thing. All the American workers are wealthy, rich, millionaires at the cost of people in the third world. No, maybe the situation is getting even worse for the American working people because uh, most of the operations of these large American corporations through their global right, uh, accumulation of this profit and wealth is coming from the working people in the third world and in Europe and the United States. So logically then, working people, masses of people, whether they're workers, peasants, unemployed, whatever it is, the large majority, if you set aside countries and nations, are in the same boat and ending up working for the same bosses. So we have a problem we have to resolve and hopefully it will be a very happy solution so that situation for greatest number of people will improve and they will if not go to heaven they might that will be a very nice gift but at least the situation here on earth they will try to make better for all thank you very much <laughs>